Open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 37. Today we come to a very special story within the Gospel of Luke. This is what we call the story of the transfiguration. Now as we consider these verses, I'd like to do two things with you this morning as we prepare our hearts for worship today. The first thing I'd like to do, there might be some who kind of wonder about this mystery of the disciples who Jesus says will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So I want to address that for anyone who's ever kind of wondered what that verse is all about. And then the second thing, and where we're going to spend the most amount of our time today, is to talk about the need for mountaintop experiences with God like we see that happens here. So let's start with uh, verse 27, but actually the verse before we get into our text today. This is what Jesus makes as a promise. He says, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Do you see that? Now, I don't know about you, but when I I see that, I wonder, well, gee, didn't all the disciples die? In fact, don't we think that most of the disciples, if not all the disciples, died a martyr's death? And as far as we know, the kingdom of heaven you know, hasn't uh, come down yet. Jesus hasn't returned the second time. So what in the world is Jesus talking about here? Well, sometimes we make this a whole lot harder on ourselves than what we have to because the kingdom of God, we discover, is really a lot more than just a place. And Luke very specifically and very deliberately answers Jesus' promise in the very next verse. We don't have to look any further than verse 28 to see what Jesus is talking about because Luke writes it this way. He says, about eight days after Jesus said this, now he's very specific there, right? Eight days after Jesus said this, what's this? He's talking about this promise that Jesus made that some of the disciples would not see or taste death before they see the kingdom of God. And then Luke goes right into it. About eight days, very specific, eight days. About eight days after this, He took some of the disciples. Who did he take? Peter, John, and James with him, and they went up to a mountain to pray. Right? So he's talking about this very promise. And so we find out here that the kingdom of God doesn't have to only refer to heaven as a place where we go to be with God and with Jesus after our death. Jesus came to proclaim that the kingdom of God is actually now, that it has come, and that it has come with Jesus, with us. And we discover actually in this, in these verses, this could be a whole separate sermon, but we'll just kind of glance at it very briefly before we go into our main topic. We discover four things about this kingdom of God that Jesus is talking about. We see, first of all, that it's entered into via prayer. You want to be in the kingdom of God, it starts with prayer. And that's true even for Jesus. So, you know, it just begs the question for us, are we actually praying for the kingdom of God to come into our life? Are we praying for a mountaintop experience? Are we praying to see the kingdom of God in our marriages? Are we praying to see the kingdom of God in our circumstances and in our family and in our world? It starts with prayer. Secondly, we see that the ordinary becomes glorious. Because in in these verses, we see this transfiguration verse that the appearance of Jesus' face changed, that his clothes became as bright as lightning, right? And when we experience the kingdom of God, we also will see things differently. We'll see as God sees. We'll we'll see God in the ordinary. We'll see the glorious in the mundane. Entered into via prayer, ordinary becomes glorious. And then thirdly, we see in the kingdom of God that death is forever defeated. And that's not something that we're talking about someday in the future. It has already happened. We just normally in our everyday lives can't see it. Let's take a look here. We see Moses and Elijah join them on the mountaintop. Now, again, this is the Moses you know, from the Old Testament. This is the Elijah from the Old Testament. And, you know, in our scientific mindset, we think, oh, this couldn't possibly happen. They've, they've been dead for hundreds of years. Well, that's not true in the kingdom of God. They are alive because in the kingdom of God, death is defeated and life reigns. 
So that kind of begs the question for those of us who have gone through some very difficult experiences where loved ones that we know have passed on, are they really dead? Or is it possible that they are now alive? Who do you know that most people think of as deceased, but you know are alive because of the kingdom of God? What great hope we see there. And then lastly, we see the kingdom of God as a place where God's will is fulfilled. A place, a time, a circumstance where God's will is fulfilled. Because we see this conversation that happens in these verses that we're going to take a close look at today. And that, that conversation is all about God's plan. What God is doing. And we're going to talk more about that later. But for now, what we want to make sure of that we know is that the kingdom of God is where God's will is always desired. And where God's will is always working out. I don't know about you, but that's the place I want to be. It's the place I want to see. Doesn't that sound like a place where you want to be, where you want to live, where you want to experience? And the truth of the matter is, and I'm just like you, we all get mired down in the ordinary and in the defeated and in the dying world that is around us. And this world, this place, and our circumstances and the experiences that we go through are mostly at odds with God's plans. And if we're honest with ourselves, and I'd like to just be honest with you today, it's very easy to be discouraged in this day and in this place. Occasionally, in the midst of this difficulty that we experience, that, of what we call life, occasionally we desperately need mountaintop experiences with God to transfigure our own faith from hopelessness to hope and from discouragement to encouragement. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to see three things that happen in these passages that bring the mountaintop experience. And, and I think there's some things that we can learn about entering into those mountaintop experiences ourselves because we, every single one of us, I don't care who you are, we all need mountaintop experiences in our life. Would you agree? Would you say, yeah, I, would, I, I could really use a mountaintop experience in my life. Would you say that to, in, in, your, in your, just your own heart to God this morning? I, you know, in, in these next few minutes, God, will you show me how I can have a mountaintop experience with you. I think if you pray that, that God's going to answer that for you today. So let's get into it. We need mountaintop experiences in our Christian life for three reasons. First of all, because we clearly see Christ's glory. We clearly see Christ's glory. Again, verse 29, we see that his face, Jesus, his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. We had some lightning this week, didn't we? And if you were out looking, you could see in, in the, maybe the doll sky how bright that flash is. Just imagine that you look like that all the time and that Jesus looked like that all the time. So bright that you kind of just have to shade your eyes a little bit. That's what we see happen here. We usually think of Jesus, and it's a good thing, that we think of him as fully man. That God left heaven in the form of Jesus and came down here and walked among us as a man. And that's great. But we need to also remember that not only was he fully man, but he was then and is now still fully God. And sometimes we get so wrapped up in the fully man part that we forget the glory of God that he also has about himself. Do you, do you remember for those of you who have read through John's gospel, we're mostly spending time in Luke's gospel here, but let's just keep our finger in Luke's gospel and turn back over to John's gospel, chapter 1, verse 14. Unless, unless you have it memorized, this is a great verse to memorize. The Word, talking about Jesus, the Word became flesh and blood moved, this is the message version, so it might be a little bit different than you've memorized, and moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> I like that. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. See, this is a glory like none other. 
one of a kind, only begotten, one and only, like father, like son. So here's the question that we have to answer ourselves today. Has God's glory moved into our neighborhood, your neighborhood? Has God's glory moved into where you are and where you live and where you work? The Christian faith is a positive faith, and boy, don't we need positive faith right now. The Christian faith is a hopeful faith, and boy, don't we need hope right now. And the Christ follower, because of the glory of Christ, can look into the depths of the depravity of this world and know that this is not the end of the story, that it's not about what is happening here and now, that the light of Christ's glory changes the ultimate outcome. That God is not finished yet. I, I don't know about you, but I'm glad about that. I'm glad in my life that God is not finished yet. I'm glad for your life that God is not finished yet. He's not finished with us. He's not finished with this world. He's not finished with our failures. He's not finished with other people's failures when you get into a judgmental attitude. And when we are most at risk of losing it or giving up or falling apart, what is it that holds us together? Paul writes to the Hebrews about the glory of God being reflected in Christ, that that's what holds us together. Let me read this to you from Hebrews 1, 3, that the Son, Son of God, reflects the glory of God and shows exactly what God is like and that he holds everything together with his powerful word. When the Son made people clean from their sins, He sat down at the right side of God, the great one in heaven. This faith that we have, the truth is, this faith sometimes is difficult to grasp. Sometimes it's difficult to grasp the glory of God and the thoughts and the minds of of God. We read in Isaiah 55 that God's thoughts and that God's ways are just too far above us, too hard for us to reach. That's why in John 1.14, what we read just a minute ago, that the Word became flesh, that God literally inhabited flesh so that we might be able to grasp God and that we might be able to see His glory. Jesus even told us through the time that he was with his disciples in John 14, 9, that if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So Jesus came in human form, and he reflects the glory of God. Now, let me tell you something about these mountaintop experiences and why this knowledge for you this morning is so important. Because you can listen to this talk about the glory of Christ and walk out and say, oh, well, we heard a nice sermon about the glory of God. But it doesn't change you doesn't do anything for you. But when you come into a mountaintop experience, when you begin to experience the glory of Christ and the glory of God in your life, it's during these times that the impossible doesn't seem quite so impossible anymore. That the horribly bad doesn't seem quite so bad. That the sickness of life, even death, pales And here's a mark word for you today, and it's temporarity, (laughs) that all these bad things, that illness, even death, pales in temporarity to God's eternal goodness that is reflected ultimately in his glory. And when we begin to experience the glory of Christ in this dull, mundane, depraved world, world. It's times like this that through his glory, he holds us together. And I don't know about you, but there are just times when I need to be held together, don't you? And when we experience Christ's glory, that happens. When we see ourselves cleansed from sin, when we know that his work which is all the work that's really important, is already done. That's what it means when it says, when the Hebrews writer says that that Jesus has sat down at the right side of God Almighty, that his work is done. He's finished. He sat down. He's done. We're just watching. And our tiresome struggles 
in those mountaintop experiences can give way to victory and peace when we see his glory. So we need those mountaintop experiences to occasionally be able to see his glory. And if it's been a while since you have experienced God's glory through Jesus, don't you want to pray, I want you to see your glory. It's been too long. I need to experience your glory because I need help together by your glory. Not only that, but in the mountaintop experience, not only do we clearly see Christ's glory, but secondly, we clearly see Christ's purpose. We see Christ's purpose. Now, we have this kind of a unusual thing that happens here. This whole, this whole passage is unusual. But let's take a look at verse 31. They, and this is talking about Moses and Elijah and Jesus, they spoke about his departure. Now, when they say his departure, they're not talking about the departure from heaven to earth. They're talking about his departure from earth to heaven. They're talking about what's about to happen. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Do you see that? Can you imagine what this conversation must have been like? So this is one of those times where you need a little bit of an imagination to kind of fill in the blanks. And Jesus' disciples, they're a little groggy at this. They had to not remember. But can you imagine this conversation taking place? Hey, Jesus, how's it going? On your way to Jerusalem now, huh? Final year. See you're on your way. How'd that feeding of the 5,000 go? Was that pretty terrific? Did, did you see the look on those people's face when those pigs flew off of the, of, of the cliff? <laughs> that was pretty terrific. That was so cool, too, when that little girl came back to life. We we're really pumped. We we're really pumped up in heaven about this Lazarus healing that's going to happen. When you bring Lazarus back from the dead, that's going to be pretty neat. And Mary and Martha, they're never going to be the same again. See, all this is happening. All this is in the preparation. There was a plan, and Jesus was following the plan. And they were all in on it, and they were all watching, and it was all coming to fulfillment. Kind of like watching your favorite movie over and over and over again. You, You know how it's going to end, but you still like watching it. You like experiencing it. Now... How does being able to see Christ's purpose so clearly on the mountaintop help us? Because let's bring it back to how this being on the mountaintop occasionally helps us. How being able to see Christ's purpose help us? Simple. If Jesus could do it, and we have Jesus' spirit, the Holy Spirit within us, then we know that we can and should fulfill God's purpose in us too. In fact, Paul writes to the church at Philippi in Philippians 2, 5 through 7, says, have the same attitude as Christ Jesus had. Although he was in the form of God, even though he was equal with God, he did not take advantage of this equality. Instead, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. You know what? We are servants also. And when we say we are servants, we don't refer to that as a degraded position because Jesus was a servant. We don't see that as a degraded position. We see this as a privilege. You get to be a servant. You get to be part of the team. We get to be in on it. God's purpose to redeem the entire world is accomplished through Christ and through his spirit and through his Christ followers, and that's you and that's me. And every now and then, we need to be reminded of this truth. We need to be reminded, and when does that happen? Oftentimes, it happens in our mountaintop experiences. When we can clearly see Christ's glory, and when we can clearly see Christ's purpose. But also, lastly here today, we clearly see also our need to worship Christ. Because when we're in those mountaintop experiences, and we see Christ's glory... And we know his purpose. We cannot help but want to worship. And let's take a look and see what happens in verse 33. This is Peter talking. I love it when Peter talks. He sometimes says exactly what we would say. And oftentimes, just like us, puts his foot right in his mouth. And here's one of those examples. He says, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters. And the idea is we're going to put up one for Elijah. And then we're going to put up one for 
Jesus, and we're going to put up one for Moses. And the verse goes on to say that Peter stuck his foot in his mouth again, and he didn't know what he was saying, that it wasn't right to worship Moses or Elijah. We worship Christ only. And also, it's not right to stop and erect monuments before the job is done and the job wasn't done yet. Jesus still had the purpose to fulfill. He still was on his way. His monument would be the cross at Golgotha, right? But Peter didn't know all that. And so we can look at Peter's heart and see that that's also our heart during any mountaintop experience. We can understand that. Because when you've had a mountaintop experience with Jesus, your greatest desire is to stop and drop everything and worship him. And when you've had the grandest mountaintop experiences, you, you, you don't want the worship to end. <laughs> and some of us have been there. Maybe, maybe you're there right now. God bless you if you are. But when you're there, you just want to stay there, right? Because you can see everything so clearly and you can experience the glory so much. And you get the picture of the purpose in your mind. And boy, it's just such a perfect thing. Let's not go anywhere. Let's just stay here and worship. And we see that that's a natural response. Again, the writer of Hebrew in chapter 12, verse 28, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And then, and thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and with awe. Now, I'll stop and think about this for just a moment. When the world around you, and, and with all the news we've been seeing, and with some of the things that we've been experiencing in our personal and family and work lives, when the world around us is being shaken to its core, there's corruption, there's hatred, there's hurting people hurting people, there's solid people that you looked up to who have fallen and and you know, they got their own sins and they've got their own hurts. It, when things around you aren't working out the way you know God would want them to work out for you and for them, you need the kingdom, the real kingdom of God in your life that cannot be shaken. You see, what we're seeing that's been shaken all around us, that's not the real kingdom of God. There is a reality that goes beyond what we can see and what we can feel. And in those mountaintop experiences, when we get to experience the real kingdom of God and we are not shaken, we are so grateful. We just want to stay in that place filled with reverence, filled with awe, filled with worship. And like Peter, it's in that moment. <laughs> Oh, we hate this, but it's in that moment that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, just kind of nudges us along and says, I'm glad you had that experience, but I'm not done with you yet. I've got some more work for you to do. You can't stay here on the mountaintop. You got to go back down into that valley. <laughs> but when you go, don't forget when you go, remember, don't discount the validity of this mountaintop experience. In fact, that's our takeaway today, that when we have a mountaintop experience, what do we do with it? Our mountaintop ex experience takeaway is this, when I can't follow by seeing, I follow by listening. In the mountaintop experience, we have no problem seeing. We don't even need to listen. We can see we, the reality of God is so real in our life. And then those mountaintop experiences, it's so great we want to stay there. And so we see this story that I think really helps us a lot here. When you think the story just couldn't get any stranger, we see in this story this cloud come in over them. And they couldn't see. And it was frightening. Let me read verse 34 and 35. A cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And I want you to know that the same thing happens to us within our own mountaintop experiences. 
In fact, I'm not even sure this was a cloud. I, I think this might have just been reality settling back in, that before they could see things so clearly, and now this cloud of unclearness, this cloud of uncertainty, this cloud of what we consider to be normal life just kind of invades that space. Where before we were so certain, now we're so unsure. Where before we could see so clearly, now everything is so cloudy. Where before we could see God's glory, now we know about his glory, but really the best we can do is to feel his presence. And sometimes that's hard. And we really can't see much of anything. And the result is it's scary. It's what they say, frightening. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever been to a mountaintop experience and then you're not, sometimes we, we wonder how it could be possible for us to move so quickly from that mountaintop experience when we could see things so clearly and now so quickly we move to uncertainty. So today's talk, I hope, will teach you two things to remind us, two things you want to remember. First thing is the mountaintop experiences are great and they're very real but they are not the norm. Mountaintop experiences are great, but they are not the norm. They are gifts that are given to us to remind us of Christ's glory, that are given to us to remind us of Christ's purpose, that are given to us to remind us of our need to worship. And some of us have come into a faith relationship with Christ on a mountaintop experience, and then we left the mountaintop experience and we were unsure about our relationship with God. God hasn't moved, God hasn't changed. It's just that we're not always on the mountaintop, okay? They're not the norm. And the second thing that you need to remember today to take away is this, that when we're not on the mountain, and that's most of the time, we remember when we were. We don't forget. And we recall what God the Father said to his three disciples, Peter, James, and John, in the midst of the mist, <laughs> In the midst of your mist, remember what God said. Listen to him. Listen to him. The truth of the matter is, is that most of the time, we cannot see clearly. Most of the time, we are not on the mountain. But no matter where I am, no matter what it is that I'm going through, I can hear Jesus if I will listen. And we have a very special word for that because listening, real listening, active listening is work. It takes effort. It's not something that you just go by while my ears are open. If you've got something to say, say it. No, it's a stop and a focus and a listening heart. And the word that we have for that is called prayer. We often think of prayer as talking, but so much more prayer is listening than it is talking. Prayer. We follow by praying, by listening. So how about you today? Are you ready for a mountaintop experience with God? 